You are from New Orleans. I am the best place ever. I'm sorry to all other places. I love it too. There is a mysticism about it. Yeah. And the first time I was there, I uh, took like a walking tour. They have these things called free tours by foot in every city. But I wrote this down from my tour years ago. He said, it's a city where the dead refuse to rest. Mm -hmm. And literally, right, because so much, so many of the coffins are above ground. They all are because the city is below sea level. So if we buried people, they'd all float. Oh my God. And so everyone is above ground. There's um, also this like third eye feeling of the city. Yeah, but you know, I have a friend who once said, ghosts don't swim. And so that's why New Orleans is such a spooky place because everyone's kind of trapped in this little kind of space surrounded by water. Yeah. Um, but I think also New Orleans is a really, truly bohemian city in America. And it really does culturally live by its own rules. So, But there's sort of, when I say, I want to be clear when I say mysticism, I mean it in a positive way. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's a mysticism to your work. Mm. And I was wondering if you felt like it came from the feel of the city at all. I think definitely um, New Orleans is a deeply spiritual place. I mean, it's a really, for a small place, it is very dense in the culture of spirit. I feel that um, but I think more than anything, one of the most spiritual things on earth, um, which is why I think people die trying to have it, is freedom. I think it's a very free place. And so I think the freedom of the city is what I've always felt the most inspired by. And I think in that, this idea of like, non-judgmentalism in pursuit of freedom is really the heart of my work. Can I let go of the self-judgment judgment I have so that I can be free to feel, so I can be free to be okay with where I am or what I'm going through yeah. um, or what I want for my life. And so I think if I hadn't have grown up in a place where I saw people saying, well, I wanna like, you know, dress in a wig and glitter and whatever four times a year, or I want to get dressed up. I mean, if you go to Mardi Gras, every single person has a boa on mm -hmm. or a this or a that. And it is very weird to not cover your face in glitter. And and it's not like this. I know a lot of people, I think, get this um, from Burning Man. But it, imagine if that essence of that kind of really controlled thing existed in some way in a city yeah. all year round in, in some capacity. That's well said. So I've always felt like writing is a form of therapy. I don't know if that resonates with you. Yeah. I, I know mean, it's your work, so it's I different. think especially poetry because, I mean, I always say that poetry was my therapy before I could afford a therapist mm. because I couldn't afford a therapist, but there was no way I could possibly understand what was going on within me unless I moved it outside of my body and put it on a page. And I always say to people that like, whether you're a writer or not, or you think about writing, like move it out of your body and put it on the page. Because when your feelings or your experiences are only living inside of you, every thought you have, you're trying to bribe or rush or move or do or uh, judge or whatever. Whereas when you put it on the page, you can see your story and you can say, wow, this is real. I really feel this way, but this isn't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And wow, I can really notice that like, this is the fifth time I've done this. Or like, why do I feel this way? Like you can really question, I think, what goes on within you when you see it in front of you. I do this really weird thing to admit, but if I don't know what advice to give myself, I think about the situation on stage as a play and mm -hmm. I say like, what would I tell my character to do? Yes, and that's I such amazing this, advice. Well, it's the same with writing. Yeah, I well, think. and like you'd also, if you were an actor who is going to take on a role, you would like study the character. And so that you, so that as you, even if you got on that stage to be them, it felt, you felt like you embodied them yeah. by really studying them so that if you cried, it came from a really sincere and high integrity place of why the character's crying. And so the thing is, is that yes, like directing your life is so powerful and also studying your life is so powerful. Mm -hmm. You mentioned feelings, big feelings. As a person who is so good with big feelings, how do you not get stuck in them? 
I do. You know, you do? I, I think we all do. I think some of us just over time, you just develop different tools and different ways to catch something as it's building because like mm -hmm. some big feelings come and they are just a big feeling, but most big feelings are the accumulation of a lot of unacknowledged small feelings. So it really mm -hmm. does kind of snowball into this bigger snowball. And so I think that part of the kind of heart work you do for yourself, spiritual work, therapeutic work, community work, where you have friends that help you acknowledge things in you is saying like, well, I have all these small things, I kind of catch them before they become one big thing, right? So like, instead of, you know, allowing for all of my unacknowledged feelings to become a resentment, which is the biggest, hardest, a big hard feeling to deal with, I can catch the unacknowledged feelings as they're coming. Yeah. Or I can catch them sooner. Or I can say like, damn, I gotta really like nip this in the bud before. And that's a practice, so obviously you don't get it right every time, I certainly don't. But even knowing what you need to attempt to do to just have a kind of more peaceful inside mm -hmm. um, is helpful. I've never heard anybody say that and it's really poignant. It is, because I've heard resentment is an unspoken no. Yeah. But it's the same thing, it's not acknowledging. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a need that that went unfulfilled and unacknowledged, yeah. So you said that you named your new book, Remember Love, because there are no two words that you have said to yourself more in the past three years. Mm -hmm. Tell me where Remember Love was born. Okay, so I am in postpartum, my postpartum period where I was experiencing some pretty incredible depression with Memphis. My, I think it was with Memphis. Yeah, with. Well, I mean, I had postpartum depression with both of my kids. I don't wish it on myself. I don't wish I would have gone through it, but I also respect that, like my body, needed to do something in order for me to know something. I, I think. I, I mean, I hope. But I, I think one something that's really interesting is is if your body's going through a funky time. Part of how you know that is if your usual stuff that helps you isn't helping. Mm. So for me, it's like if I'm having a hard day or I'm feeling a little low or I'm feeling a little anxious, it's like I get in the bathtub, I listen to Tara Brock and he's this meditation teacher I've listened to for 15 years. So I get in and I'm kind of like, oh, like my, I'm just foggy. I'm like, I'm kind of listening. I'm kind of not. I'm just like in that kind of, you know, that days of like, that, I mean, I'm sure so many people feel it, especially in our world right now. It's like so hard to break the fog. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden she's speaking and I just hear her say, remember love. In a sentence, it, I don't even think it was the point of the sentence. I couldn't even tell you the episode, but I heard her say it. Yeah. And it just shifted something in me. Like it didn't cure my postpartum depression by any means, but it pulled me. Like it, it just, it, it did, it was as if someone like grabbed my shirt and pulled me out mm -hmm. um, to say like, something's going on. And I think, I mean, obviously I believe in the power of words. Words saved me every time I needed saving. Like I read Rumi poems or Maya Angelou poems or Langston Hughes poems or Mary Oliver poems that truly like, you know, when like Mary Oliver said, joy is not meant to be a crumb that changed my life. That changed the way I understood and sought after joy. Yeah. Um, and made space for joy. And so I know that I know that power. And I feel so lucky that I, you know, get to work in that power where I know that words have really helped so many people in my community through a hard time. And so when I heard those two words, they kind of became my mantra. I remember I got a post-it note and I wrote on it, please remember love. And I put it on the top of a board. Mm -hmm. And I think there was something about those words that helped me find where I was not being kind to myself, which is what actually created like the stuckness of my postpartum depression. Mm. So like, I think when you're moving slowly, you're kind of mean to yourself. So I think that that's whether you're a runner and you sprained, you're, you know, you have a pulled muscle and you're just like, oh, my body, my body, I'm mad at my body. When your body is actually just saying, slow down so I can heal. And you're saying, no, this is what I want to be doing. And this is what I think you should be doing. And you're making me feel like I'm broken. And that's making me feel like my life is like ending instead of, you know, beginning or plateauing. And, right. and so I think 
for me when I was, I didn't realize that I had so much wrapped into productivity and getting things done and being able to be that person for so many people and do and do and do and do that I was mad at myself. I had shame in not being able to do. And I didn't even know, I actually realized that I didn't really know how to love myself as a non-doer, as just a, as, as a beer. And so in that, when I, I could, when I heard the words, remember love, I kept being like, okay, could, could I remember love when I talk to myself? Like what, what I'm hearing inside be something I would say to somebody I love mm -hmm. because I am someone I love too. There's, uh, I have like five copies of Heart Talk oh my over God. there. And I, I, I love books cause I love words. And I keep, I have a whole bookshelf, but I keep a few in my room and I keep Heart Talk mm -hmm. in my room by my bed. And so much of it is about love and heartbreak. And I was reading Remember Love and thinking, this is love too, but this book is about self-love. Yeah. Is that how you felt writing it? You know, I remember even when Heart Talk came out, people were like surprised I wrote about, because I think at the time it was kind of right, you know, around the 2016, 2017 elections and, and, and America was having such a politically charged time. Yeah. And so many of my words and writings had been used in the kind of political sphere. Did you intend for that or did it, because your words became activism in a lot of yeah. ways. I don't know that it was an intention, but I wasn't really surprised by it because I certainly was inspired by the ways in which poets and writers like Alice Walker or Angela mm -hmm. Davis or um, Gloria Steinem, how they did create words that activated people, um, even if it was just through a poem or, or Lu Lucille Clifton. Like, and so I think for me, um, Toni Morrison, Aunt Maya Angela, yeah. like I, I think there were so many I, ways in which like, you know, how and still I rise mm. is endemic to the human experience and the political or the human endurance needed to kind of survive our political systems and their yeah. injustice and inequities. And so I'm never surprised when poetry is kind of brought into the mix. Do you know what yeah. I don't think it's like a, I think it makes total sense that at every, you know, presidential inauguration since Kennedy, there's a poet there, do yeah. you know, because I think poetry really does bring to life our, you know, most interior wants, desires and stories and creates a space for us to imagine um, because it brings art to our emotional life. And I think when we can, or it turns our emotional life into an art mm -hmm. that can be shared. I wasn't surprised, but you know, at the time when I was writing Hard Talk, they were like, well, should this be a, like people really thought, I think thought I would kind of have created a work that was more specific to words for a political time mm -hmm. rather than words for the heart. Um, I think they thought it would be more like words for the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I would always say like, you can't think about how to be a good citizen until you've figured out how to like be a person you're proud of. Like you can't figure out like how to be kind to your neighbor without self-kindness, without knowing how to give yourself a pep talk, without knowing how to be your own friend. And so Heart Talk was really this book that was like, this is about building yourself up, like just a building and a building and a building. Um, and I think Remember Love is about like a true like investigation into the self. It is as if, I mean, I remember when I was writing it, I was kind of going through some of my toughest moments and I was like, gosh, if I, every time and in various ways, whether it was through heartbreak, whether it was through disappointment in work, whether it was through disappointment in my family, in myself and relationships, every time I felt like I was lost in the dark and I was looking for the light and I'm searching and I'm searching and I'm searching until I realized I can only turn it on within and that I was the light the whole damn time. Yeah. How did I like, how could I retrace that? And so for me, remember love is like truly a trail of breadcrumbs of like getting back to your light within. There's, I don't wanna butcher what you said because I don't have it in my notes, but I remember listening to you on a podcast and you were talking about uh, how you were going through a really kind of tough relationship. This guy was not being kind to you. He mm -hmm. didn't like feel your soul. Yeah. And you had a friend call you and she said something like, this has nothing to do with him. Why do, do you feel like this is what you... Yeah, she said, I'll never forget my say? friend Sade and one of my best friends. I met her on the dance floor in New York City 15 years ago <laughs> and um, we're still best friends. Shout out to Sade Lithcott. Um, I am 
obsessed, obsessed with this guy most of my 20s. Like, shall remain nameless, but ugh, obsessed. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he's broken up with me again when really he probably just like didn't call me back. And um, <laughs> which um, feels like a breakup sometimes. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Ghosting, like all the all the stuff. Like, I mean, those are real, like, you know, like these things like hurt yeah, our feelings. They do. And so I say to my friend Sade, she was like, you know what, Cleo? She was like, I think you need to ask yourself, what do you believe? She says, do you believe that at this time in your life, I don't know how old I am, maybe 23. And she's like, do you believe that this is like the only person you will ever be with? Do you believe that love is something that doesn't love you back? Do you believe that um, you should always be chasing? Like all the things that were, were going on in this relationship, I put in quotes, relationship, she was like, everything that was a reality, she kind of like affirmed everything that was a reality and was like, do you but believe put it into this? A question. Do you believe this is like, this is how love functions? And I never realized that the problem was not him. It was my belief system. Like I had not yet worked on my belief system. I'd come from a place and a, you know, kind of childhood and ways, what I saw was, wow men doing whatever they wanted to do and women always making it okay. And that I think in deep in my, in my belief system, which is not an opinion, beliefs are deeper than your opinions. Yeah. Like beliefs inform your opinions. And so, and beliefs and where in, in your beliefs is usually where your trauma is, it's where your unhealed things are. Like that's actually what's even below the beliefs. And so when I was having these like, opinions of like him or me or right or wrong or da, da 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 like all of that was powered by the beliefs I had around love. And so when I actually got home and really questioned like, what do I believe? Why do I believe that? I found a lot of, you know, pain and heartbreak. I found a lot of like, you know, there's gotta be something different. And I really started to think about how to heal what caused me to believe these things. And that was eventually how I let go of truly being obsessed with I mean, eventually, because- Did you have to hard. break your own heart? Like, were you still in love with him when you ended it? I think you're in love with everyone when you end it. You know, yeah. you just, I think that's why A, every breakup takes at least six months oh. to detach. Yeah. Um, I write about this, remember love, I think that love is a, a line within and once it's crossed, you will just live on the other side. Mm -hmm. I think you want things more than you want the person that you're in love with. Yeah. Um, and so whether that's the type of relationship you want, like I want a partner who wants to, travel the world with me or be in this with me or like cohabitate with me or have kids or be able to have conversations like this or be able to sit with my friends in this way. Like, you know, you want different things. And so more than you want the relationship. You have to always ask yourself, I think when you're going through a breakup to keep yourself from calling or going back, what do I want more than I want this person who is yeah. not going to give me what I need? That's a good question. What do I want more than I want this person? Yeah. I also have never heard the belief system idea you presented. Yeah. So it's trauma, wounds, beliefs, then opinions. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, that's why you can see it. Like it's, it's really easy to poke holes in opinions. It's really hard to overcome beliefs. Yeah. And there's like nothing you can do with somebody else's pain and trauma. Like they have to heal it themselves. So you write in this book, we don't work for those we love, we work with them. Mm -hmm. A loving relationship is a collaboration. We contribute to a shared and sacred experience. I was on a plane recently. <laughs> Where were you going? And I was coming back to LA from Tucson, Arizona. And I am sitting next to this guy on the airplane and because I ask a million questions, he starts telling me about his relationship. He's in love with this woman, but he doesn't feel like she's loving him sacredly. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? And he said something that was so profound. He was like, when you love somebody sacredly, the way they show up with their friends at work, at their workouts, everything changes because they feel so full and they have the capacity to give to other people. And I was kind of embarking on an egg freezing journey mm -hmm. and my results from the year before, like the nurse called me and all of my tests, my scores had gone up and I had not changed anything in my life except for I had been loved sacredly. Mm. And I thought just for my personal experience, 
how wild that there was quantitative evidence yeah. of that sacred love. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're talking about in this commitment idea. Yeah, and in that, again, their safety. Yeah. You know, when there's stress, stress is the absence of feeling safe. Um, and that stress really, really puts your body through it. And I think that like to be in a consistent, loving, nurturing environment reduces that stress and like allows your body to like naturally and freely do what it wants to do without fear. Coming from a relationship where you didn't feel safe, how has being loved sacredly changed how you show up? Well, I think there's two things. One, it's very hard to have love exists in a sacred space if the sacred space does not start within. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, you really have to work on self-worth to be able to find relationships that exist uh, in the highest possible integrity, spirituality, sacredness, whatever we want to call it. Mm -hmm. But I think until you realize that you deserve that or can have that, you'll never find it and you'll actually just often find things that affirm whatever you believe about yourself. And mm. so I think that like, if we feel like, oh, like I should just be happy to be with somebody, you'll be with just somebody. And I think the more you say like, I have so much love to give and like, I know that it's possible for me to find someone who wants to bring as much love to the table as I have to bring to the table. I think that you will find that that it's different. Or you say to yourself, like, these are things I really want and these are things I really know are possible for me. I think your life will affirm you with people like that. And so I think for me, I did a lot of that kind of work for myself first to even, I think, attract someone like my current partner, Simon, who we do have this very sacred, loving love and bond, um, but more than and, within that, if I was going to kind of pull at it to say like, what makes something sacred? So for example, I think the word sacred is like, for everyone viewing this could mean 50 different things. Does yeah. it just feel sparkly? Does it feel like a rainbow? Does it feel like a unicorn? Does it feel spirit, like spiritual? Does it feel soulful? Is it a feeling you have in church? Is it a feeling, do you know, like, yeah. what does that mean? And I would say that it is a bond of respect and integrity where at no point in your relationship is self-betrayal required. Great. And I think that's what I would call being a sacred space or a shelter for right. those you love. Less alone. It's on the first page of the book. Yeah. I think it's a theme throughout. And I could be projecting, but I, I feel like oftentimes through our work, we seek to heal ourselves in many ways. Yeah. Are you somebody that you, like, do you consider yourself lonely? I feel that there's no way to be human and not feel lonely. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly go through moments and times of loneliness if for no other reason than every single day of your life, you are the last one with your thoughts and feelings. And that is a space of aloneness. So mm -hmm. often the reason I, you know, the reason my hope is to get books like Remember Love into the hands of everyone I know is actually because I feel that I write for that moment. So I feel that I write for like, you know, change, right? Change, the act of change is actually pretty easy, right? It's really easy to say, here's my name signed on a sheet of paper. The feelings that accompany putting your signature on your divorce papers and your marriage of 25 years ending is impossible to handle. Mm -hmm. And even if you have great support, you know, you talk to your lawyer after you talk to your therapist after you have all your girlfriends at your house and you're having wine and cheersing to like the end of this era, when you put on your pajamas and you go to bed and your head hits the pillow and you're not falling asleep right away, you are alone with your feelings. Yeah and no one else is feeling exactly what you're feeling but you. And there's such incredible loneliness to feel alone in, in this like very tender, tough thing. And so for me, I think that that's why I'm always so happy that people say, I keep your book by my bedside because that's where I hope people have it mm -hmm. is wherever they are, 
you know, I don't, I've never had somebody say like, I take it to the gym with me. Like, do you know what I mean? It is really like, or even I take it to the beach. I think people say yeah. I live with it. It lives on my bedside table. And it's There's because I hope that in the morning, if you just, if it's just you and your thoughts in the evening, if it's just you and your thoughts, I do try to write something where you can feel that there is a friend or someone who sees you in that moment. That's really beautiful. There's this theme of rebirth in the book. You use the words rebirth, return, reclaim, recover yeah. repeatedly. Yeah. Uh, two of my quotes that I pulled out were, we leave ourselves behind because facing ourselves means facing our feelings. It's hard to love a stranger. It's extra hard when, when that stranger, oh, excuse when me. When change has turned the stranger into you. Yeah. I love that you know yeah. your book by heart. That is like the most quoted thing to me, my whole, of, of every one I've sat down really? with. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that's resonating with people? What's it hitting? I think that, and there's a poem in the book that is probably the shortest poem in the book. It's probably 10 words on a page. Yeah. And it's called, It's Simple. And the text of the poem is, um, every time you change, get to know yourself again. I think what so many of us go through is that we shift and we change and we become different people and we try to give the same needs or the same type of awareness and attention to an outdated version of ourselves. Mm. And I think everyone goes through that where they're just like, wait, like it's kind of what I was talking about in postpartum where I was like, wait, the bathtub and the podcast are not working right now because I'm a different person right now than I usually am. And I think women I experience need, that I don't want to say more so because everyone's unique, but I hear from women that they really feel that. And I think women often are given really specific emotional roles. And so shifting out of who you are means mm -hmm. you might be shifting your whole family unit. Yeah. So much of what I write about in this book is this idea of being the glue, right? Like this mm -hmm. thing of you call yourself the glue, but as you hold it all together, who is holding you? When we are the doers or um, the glue, meaning we're a utility, we're not the thing, we're the tool that holds the thing together, but we don't get to be in the thing. If you're the glue, you're not, the, you're not a person, you're not in the family. You're something that um, is facilitating for the family. Yeah. Um, I think in that, that does tend to be women because I think that we do tend to just kind of emotionally hold together communities. So if all of a sudden your emotional life shifts and you feel you need different things because you feel like a different person, how do you give yourself permission to have it if everyone's counting on you to always stay the same so that you can continue to provide? That's really hard. Fair. And so I think even like when you think of just culturally how much forgiveness or not even forgiveness, but okayness we give to men changing, it's like for some reason only men go through midlife crises. Like that's so insane. Like only men should be like, oh, of course he just wanted a sports car or this or that. And he just feels like a totally different person and he gets to go through a totally different phase of life. And we just call, and we call women just going through menopause as if it's just this physical condition that we go through and has nothing to do with our personalities or our like desires to like have as much out of life as possible as we right. kind of get to the, the middle part of it. It's a, it's a physical condition that we have. And so I, I think it's really, you know, there's so much that th this idea that like men get to go through phase, true phases of mm -hmm. life, whether that's like, you know, being a boy, and he's just, he's just a school kid. He's just, a, he's just a boy. Should be like, time to be a man. And then like, time to be a dad. Like, I mean, there's so much. And I think women, often whatever role you play in your family of origin, you're really asked to play it your whole life. Oh, yeah. um, and then you probably marry into or take part in relationships that require that same role. Do you resent it at all or do you embrace it? I think I'm reckoning with it. I mm -hmm. think that we, you know, have the power to change that in our own ancestry and lineage ourselves. And so I think for me, I always think about the ways in which I can actively change the physical and spiritual DNA of my family. Like I, I always think about what can I show my daughters that's different than what I saw? Um, how can I, like, even by being able to name and understand this idea of the glue, like, what do I do with that once mm -hmm. I learn it? And so I think that the journey of, you know, reckoning with like, how am I in these roles based on what I've attracted? How am I in these roles based on like what the world tells me things have to be? Mm -hmm. How, you know, there's, I mean, there's so many factors, but I think being in it 
and and putting my own power and ideas in it and, and working on the ways in which I think I can shift and change and ask for different things really helps because then I don't feel like I'm victim to it. I feel that I have, you know, I get to claim or reclaim agency. You write in this book, to live is to get lost. Mm -hmm. There's sort of like a spiritedness behind that line, I felt. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable sharing a time when you felt really lost? I go through seasons of feeling lost regularly. I think that we feel lost when we move to a new place. I certainly had that when I moved, even I moved to Los Angeles when I had Memphis. So maybe January of 2020, I think I was here by November of 2019. And then I had her. It's a strange Jen, time to move. It was a very strange time. And I remember just like waking up because I didn't, I've never had a desire to live in Los Angeles. So I think that that was also a thing. Like I was kind of like, what am I doing here? But my, Simon, my partner has kids from a previous marriage and I wanted everyone to be together. So we came here, I came here to have Memphis and it was, I felt lost for, I mean, A, because I ended up having my postpartum period was tough. And then the pandemic happened and I was like kind of inside and kind of like really alone and in, in, in child rearing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't even think my mom or dad saw my kid until she was six months old oh, because wow. of, you know, traveling and COVID, it, all the, the things of That's like, right. you're so, you, we were so afraid during that time. And so I think um, it was, a definitely a period of feeling lost, like, wow, am I working from here? Am I like, what What does it look like to um, kind of build community here? Did um, you feel lost? Because you became a poet in your 20s, right? Mm -hmm. Did you feel a sense of lostness during that time? I can't imagine like being like, yeah, I'm going to be a poet and yeah. I'm also going to feed myself. It's a really yes. hard being thing. Deciding to write was actually like a period of foundness, but the I'd say the entirety of my teens and very, very early 20s, like until 22, I felt like just completely lost. Mm -hmm. I felt like someone who was just surviving. Like I just got jobs Aww. and had made money. And like, you know, because I didn't, I moved to New York at 17. I didn't have a safety net. I didn't, I'm not an educated person. You know, I think so for me, you are, it though. was, well, I guess traditionally educated, yeah. but yes. And so I think for me, it was very like, I've just got to work and I've got to, you know, get through and I'll figure out my life. But I knew that I wanted to be in New York. And I'd and I and I'd always kind of like spiritually been drawn to that as a place. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the only place I could ever imagine living that wasn't New Orleans, because New Orleans is just so special. Was it what you wanted it to be? Yes, I love New York. I miss it every day. Oh. I know. I, I mean, I love New York. I think there's nothing I, you know, I think it's a literary it's, city. It's your city. It's, it's really just yeah. for some people or it's not, but I truly do feel that I am like the, you know, like the almost toxic lover of New York, <laughs> like, like a, like a Fran Leibowitz or something where it's just like, mm, this is not healthy, but like, we're going with it. That's um, funny. You yeah. and Fran. Me and Fran. Me and Fran. <laughs> what do you feel like has been the penultimate moment of your career so far? And I, it's open-ended purposely. Gosh, you know, I wrote this thing in um, Remember Love that said, um, when the, it said, when the material is at the center of my goals, when I cross the finish line, even if I'm holding the first place trophy, um, there's some loneliness there. Mm -hmm. When the relational is at the center of my goals, when I cross the finish line, whether I'm I win or I lose, I'm what's held. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, my friendships and being able to sustain them through so much change in my work and all the things I do that, you know, especially as I sat down to write this book and sitting down to write Remember Love, I was, you know, it was around 10 years since I started writing Heart Talk because it took time to, to kind of write it and piece it together. And I was just so, like it was such a kind of, I guess I'd call it a career highlight um, because I felt so present and so purposeful and so like, wow, I still get to sit in my living room with all these women that I love and eat takeout and then 
turn the greatest things I learned from the people I love into books that help people. Yeah, in 2017, you did a TED Talk mm -hmm. titled Want to Change the World, Start by Being Brave Enough to Care. Yeah. You just care so much. Oh, my God. I really do. Yeah. But I think it's like, what else are we doing with our lives, you know, if we're not caring and caring yeah. for the people that we know love or like, and, and I guess to me too, I, I really do believe in thoughtfulness. And I also believe that people, I don't think we're an accident. I don't think we meet people by accident. I don't think that we're in the world at this time with the people where that we're around by accident. I don't think that even when we're in the midst of calamity and tragedy and it's happening, like if you even, f if you're, if it's happening while you're on this planet, then like you, that to me means that somehow you're a part of the solution or somehow you're a part of helping even just one person. I think so too. And so I think that, I think because I just don't believe we're a mistake. I feel like your work has allowed people to embrace the idea that it's cool to care. Because I think we hear the phrase all the time, like DGAF, don't give a fuck. Yeah. And whoever gives the least amount of fucks wins. Yeah. And as somebody who has always given all of the fucks yeah. all the time, <laughs> totally. I just feel like you made it cool to care. You know, I think that there's just power in, I think there's actually power and I don't give a fuck. And I remember writing in Heart Talk, there's a page that says like, remember not to care about the things you don't even care about. So I think that there are things that are truly like unimportant, like mm -hmm. somebody else's drama or somebody like, you know, that is truly inconsequential to all, like all the time. Like my mom is like such a gossip and she'll just like scoot in the kitchen. I don't know why they all scoot. She'll scoot in the kitchen and be like, so, you know, to I'm like, ah, uh, I gotta pause you there. I can't give this real estate. Like, I love that you did that you know? eyebrow up when you said it. <laughs> like, but I like that. I can't give this real estate. Yeah. Like, I was like, it's don't, good. do not, do not, do not. I was like, I don't even want to like bring it in because it is yeah. truly like not a single person involved is gonna care about it tomorrow. Like, do you know what I mean? It's not, or, and, like, like truly care about it. So, like, if it's important, yes. But mm -hmm. if it is truly like, well, she said she thought her hair was weird. And you're like, oh, n none of that's not going to bother anybody in like 20 minutes. Yeah. You just are like, it's making you feel spicy. Okay, I'm going to tell you my favorite line from the book. It was, I know that's hard to do. Oh my God. And I'm, I'm curious to know if it's been other people's. So you write, I'm sorry is the blessing of all blessings. Mm -hmm. Whoa. I never thought of I'm sorry as a blessing. It's a blessing to you and to the person you're sharing yeah. it with. Well, I'm sorry is this is shorthand for I I feel see. ashamed. I don't think it's ashamed because I think actually if we can pull shame out of I'm sorry, okay. we could more freely gift I'm sorry as like an offering to both of us. And I think what, what ends up happening is that because we wrap shame in it, people don't want to acknowledge it mm -hmm. and therefore they can't acknowledge what happened. Okay. And so I think that when we say I'm sorry, it's really shorthand for I see you and I understand that there was harm caused. Like I understand that something just happened. Okay. And I think that when you can just even start with acknowledgement, because there is nothing you can heal without first seeing it. Like you cannot heal a wound if you cannot identify where the wound is. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, I'm sorry is something you say, not for you, not for me, but for us. It is something that is like truly two words that are for the building of our bond in our community. I really like that. It's for us. Yeah, and, and it is like it is. And I, and I think that that's why sometimes you have to have humility to say it because you're kind of like, well, here's a 20 reasons why I ended up doing what I did and da, 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 da. And, and, and it's really like there's so many things that stand between us and I'm sorry. And they're in there and all those things are valid ways mm -hmm. to feel every way you feel is real like that is true. But like, what do you want to do with what you feel and what do you want more than like a feeling you've had? Like, do you want to actually come inside from the cold and be with your family? And is I'm sorry the only thing that's standing between you and like the warmth of the people you love? It's interesting to me too, because sometimes I'm sorry feels hard to say because you don't feel like you did anything wrong even though you see someone else's pain. So the idea of yeah. making it for us 
Yeah. I think it makes it easier to and, say. And understanding like, what does it mean? Like, is it like, I see you and I see that you're hurting. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. I, I see that. I see that there is hurt. Like, I'm sorry. It is, it is shorthand for, I see what you're, I see that this is hurting you. Mm -hmm. And I think that like in any situation, there's always accountability to be had in some way. There just is. The very personal question. Tell me. What has been the hardest apology you've had to share? My hardest apology. Um, I think I've had to apologize. One of my hardest apologies is probably one to myself. Mm -hmm. I think self-forgiveness is one of the hardest things ever. And it's like, we rarely say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, we, we rarely say those words to ourselves. Like we even think about the concept of self-forgiveness, but we, it's a kind of this abstract thing of like, I should just feel better about this thing. But like, have you ever just kind of like put your hand on your heart and been like, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm sorry that like, you know, I like didn't make you safe in this place or I didn't, you know, I, I felt that you deserved this or like, or that, you know, I'm really mm -hmm. sorry that you didn't like, we couldn't have done better in this way or whatever. The self-talk. Yeah. And so I think, yeah. I think that, and then I think, you know, I'm sorry is also just, is truly a practice that's so helpful. Like, even if you, I think, especially in relationships, you feel like I'll say, I'm sorry to my mom or Simon or my partner, just in like, in ways where like most people would not maybe say it because they're like, well, we're like related, we're together. Like, you know what I meant, but it's amazing actually to bring those words into like the people you're with the most that you think just like should know or know you love them. So it doesn't matter. Like whenever I have like, maybe like, gotten a little too harsh with my mom about something or been like, you know, frustrated with her. When I come back around and say like, I'm sorry for like, you know, expressing my frustration so harshly. Yeah. Um, I do think that it builds our bond instead of like, and I think that the, the lack of apology does, even if it's one tiny crumb kind of crumbles it. And I think it's the same with Simon. I think that I don't think there's ever been a time where Simon wasn't like grateful that I apologize for something. Yeah. And I think bringing it into like, not in a casual way, but like just not making it the biggest deal ever to have to apologize is also just really helpful and healthy. You're right. The lack of re recognition like builds resentment. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then like it also builds such a distance between you and this blessing mm -hmm. that you're like, it's like, it's like that friend you can't call because like more and more and more stuff happens that you're like, I can't get on the phone with you because I can't be on the phone for two hours, like to tell you about everything. Yeah. So you just start avoiding your friend because you like know that you are that favorite aunt you have because you know you don't have the time to tell them everything mm -hmm. um, when you're like, you should just call them like, and just start. And if you have to go, you have to go. Yeah. Um, but I think that we really start to avoid, I'm sorry, we avoid apology the like less we do it. Um, There's been a movement for that because women have been apologizing. Yeah. And yeah, but there's apologizing for something existing. that's important. <laughs> and then there's apologizing for existing. Yeah. Like, but I think we've oh, lost sorry. That. Like we say, sorry, instead of excuse me, we say, sorry. Like if you're putting your, I guarantee you, if you're putting your suitcase up above and it's like, someone's right there, you're like, sorry. Instead of being like, excuse me, like for doing the thing, of course I have to do that yes. like everyone is doing. But I think because we've tried so hard to eliminate that word, there's sort of this backlash of like, we've missed yes. the, I'm so sorry. You say big beginnings and big endings change us. I would kind of argue that one runs into the other. What do you think? Mm, like, give me an example. Well, it doesn't, it's not inverse. It, I think big endings bring new beginnings always. Mm -hmm. New beginnings don't necessarily bring new endings. You know, I think it's, I, I definitely see what you're saying. And I think to me, it's like a, not so much about like linking them, but like honoring each individual experience. So like the idea that like you can have like a big beginning might be like you met somebody and you have this extremely serious relationship and it actually makes all of the other relationships in your ecosystem change and some shed and like some friendship dynamics change and some family dynamics change because as you would say, a sacred love really changes your existence, right? So I'd say that's a big beginning that really changes us. Yeah. Big endings change us. You know, my best friend's father passed away two weeks ago and she will just never be the same person again. Yeah. She is forever changed. And so I think big, you know, I think I will always be 
different because of the big ending of my, you know, 13 years in New York. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big ending and it really changed a lot for me um, as well as like, and it did bump into a new beginning and a big beginning in Los Angeles, but they don't always have to. Yeah. I think uh, always and never are not great words yeah. either. So I probably shouldn't have said that. There's a term you use called spiritual investigation. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of that. Can you share a lesson you learned by being curious like that? Well, I think, okay, you have a feeling, right? Um, and a feeling makes you like say something and you don't mean what you said. Like spiritual investigation would say like, why did I feel this strongly about this thing? Like, why did I, like, where did that come from? So again, like spiritual investigation could bring us back to opinions, beliefs, trauma, um, you know, um, pain. So like the, the investigation is how, what you would say instead of just being like, what do you see, opinion? Like, of course, it's just what I think, my opinion, da, da, da. And you're like, well, like, how do we get here? Like, mm -hmm. I always wonder how we got here. And I think that that's a big part of like understanding even our political spheres of like, when someone is, you know, there's so many topics that are so socially charged when someone talks to you about them. And every single time, if you spiritually investigated the pain point from which everything stems, you'd understand why someone feels or votes or is the way they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are writing Valentines to yourself nowadays. Mm. What does that mean? Why? So I write in the book about this time where recently, like as I was writing the book, my mom brought me a Valentine I'd written to her. It was like a school project in second grade. And it was um, writing a Valentine to your parents. Mm -hmm. And I'd written this Valentine to my mom. And it had said, like, I show my love for you. Bye. That was the prompt. So there were three and it was, I don't remember all three offhand, although it is in the book, but it's, I show my love for you by not talking when you're on the phone. I show my love for you by like doing all the dishes, getting the dishes done. I show my love for you by, there was another, there was another one I can't remember, but every single one of them was like something I did to accommodate her need. Mm -hmm. You know, while I so respect and love my mom and all that she did as a single parent raising us, I'd wondered at what point in my personal life did this like kind of desire to accommodate kind of turn into making myself invisible in relationships mm -hmm. because you'd have the like, you know, oh my God, like my mom is like so loved because I like just, you know, made sure I was doing the thing that she needed in the moment. So if that starts as your pattern, then you end up being in relationships with people where the entire basis of your connection is like ways in which you accommodate their needs. Mm -hmm. And if you're solely accommodating the needs of the others, you're, there's no way that there's equity in how yours um, fulfilled. Do you catch yourself now still, even with all the self-work fighting that? It's all practice. Like mm -hmm. the, the idea that we do the work to like kind of win or lose something. I say that about self-care. It's like, we look at self-care as a battle. We either win or we lose based on the work that goes in. But we say work we might when we should maybe even say practice. It's like anything else. Mm -hmm. The practice of anything is never done. People practice playing chess their whole lives. They practice, you know, even if you're Serena Williams, you practice. It's not like, oh, you made the Grand Slam that time. And so, you know, or like you just go play tennis again one day. Yeah. You just got it. I love the idea of soul contracts mm. that you bring up. Can you share what they are? So I'm in San Francisco. I'm not actually, no, I'm in New York, but I'm talking to this woman in San Francisco who recently passed, actually. She was this amazing astrologer. She introduces the concept of a soul contract to me. And I was like, what does that mean? And she said that a soul contract is when you understand that like every relationship has like terms and a time limit. And because we change so much, like sometimes we renew it with new terms because like that's our change self or we kind of rip it up. And so there's this idea that we like, you know, you could have a soul contract with your parents, for example. And then in adulthood, you likely need to like renew it with different terms because like yeah. you can't be their small little daughter anymore because that's not like the reality of the situation and that, that contract is outdated. I love this idea because I think if we were to 
do this with friendships, in relationships, marriages. Yeah. And we both like came to the table with expectations, agreements, terms. We would be in such a, um, I think we'd find more fulfillment and less frustration in our relationships. What I'd also say is even in marriage vows, it's like, it's interesting to think about the people who renew vows. Huh. Like, I wonder what it would look like for them to like, you know, redesign vows every five years or something like even as a practice, but where it acknowledges where you are now and what you need now and yeah. what you vow to do to help with the other person. And so soul contracts aren't necessarily like something you actually write up, although I'm sure you could, but they are something that to me really helped me understand how to like let go of some people that like, where you're like in that kind of old, like saying a season of reason, a lifetime, whatever, where you're like, you know, like our contracts just up and of being very close friends. And now we're just, our new contract is that we're people who used to be really good friends and love yeah. each other and we see each other. And like, that's the integrity of the situation and or the relationship. And, you know, you were the, you were the guy I was obsessed with in my twenties. And like, you're not the, like, our contract does not have you being like the father of my children. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do a little rapid fire. Okay, I'm ready. A word you just love. A word I love. You know, I love the word beloved. I love the word. It's my it's my daughter's middle name, my second daughter, Bayou's middle name. Um, I use it in so many different poems. It's just, there's something like, even if I, someone writes me a note and it ends with beloved or like the question does, or mm. like, it's something, it's a word I feel like I can laugh at. And when it's used in a certain text, it's a word I use, I think is just like so sweet and tender. Um, and I've used it in so many of my writings. I saw a psychic for the first time a few years mm. ago and she calls everybody beloved. Yes, it's very Southern to do that too. They yeah. call everybody like baby and beloved. Nice, it's warm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if you were to tell me to travel to one place you've been that I must see. That you must see. I mean, I guess I would say, but you've already been, I would say New Orleans. I, I think that New Orleans is a place every person should go. Yeah. It's, it truly is amazing. A simple pleasure you've been introduced to lately. My simple pleasure lately is actually that is watching like Disney movies with my kids, like rewatching. Mm. Cause now they're both at the age. Like I, I never was the like, I'm not a TV parent. I was always like, I don't care. Like there's nothing better in life than being in bed and watching a movie. And like, why would I like rob my children of that at two? Yeah. And so um, we've like <laughs> always been in bed. Like my like three and a half year old has this like insane attention span because of it. And she can literally watch like a league of their own. I love that. It is that. crazy. Do they eat in bed too? Oh yeah, we'll just snack. Well, like we just. That's a pleasure. And so oh, my simple pleasure recently is I usually go like old school. So I just have my own nostalgia around the Disney movies I watch. Yeah. Um, but I watched Tangled recently. Yeah. And Mandy Moore is the voice of Tangled. And she's like <laughs> such a nostalgic thing for me that I was like, wow, this movie is amazing. And all the songs are so good. And so like my daughters and I have been watching Tangled like every other day. And I'm like, this is beyond, I'm obsessed. I was it's just like, gonna ask you if they like it as much as you do. Bayou definitely does. Memphis like thinks we're insane. She's like, can we please try? She's like, mom, we have to try something new. I was like, oh, your sister wants to watch Tangled. And she's like, I'm excited for them to watch Big Daddy. I feel like every kid, that's like a, a movie they have to watch. Yes. Okay, the most consequential no in your life. The day I said no to being a yes person mm -hmm. and like an accommodator in that way was like the most life-changing no. Like the day I like said no to only being a yes person mm -hmm. and then just figuring it out, I think really changed everything for me. Okay, a book that you've read, something that you feel like everybody should read. All About Love by Bell Hooks, for sure. At least, I mean, I could give you a million book recommendations, but oh, yeah. This is a bookie podcast, so feel free. Oh, okay. Yeah. I would say All About Love. I would say Beloved by Toni Morrison, although it's sad. I mean, all of her books are so sad. You're just like, damn it, Tony. <laughs> um, but they're so beautifully written. The Fire Next Time. Um, I'd say if you're going through a breakup, The Mastery of Love is like one of the best books you could ever read if you're going through a breakup. Oh, that's a good. My friend Jenna has this amazing book she just released on human design called My Human Design, I think. 
That's excellent. For most women, I think a really important book to read is my friend Taz just released a book called The Hormone Shift. Mm. She's amazing. You should talk to her. She's so great. The Color Purple, absolutely. Mm. Um, any book by Mary Oliver, any book by Maya Angelou, especially Letters to My Daughter is so incredible. What's the best thing you've ever quit? <laughs> Whiskey. Mm. Oh, they all still have one sometimes, but I don't really drink hard alcohol anymore. But I still have wine. <laughs> How many do I do? Do what you, I, I felt you, do another. Most likely to splurge on clothing. Mm. You have a great closet. Oh, you I do. really do. I also have a great shout out to Shiana Torini because she has like unfortunately changed my aesthetic and it's made me broke. She just like, Wait. she's my stylist and she literally is just like, I'm well, like why, what has changed? Cause I've always found it to be bohemian, but simple and sophisticated. I know, she just like showed me the nicer things of life. Yeah. And now I'm like, oh, I get it. Like that's why that sweater is so much more expensive mm. than this sweater, it's so nice. She introduced you to the row. Yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> it really is, it really is. And then you're just like, it really is. Yeah. One thing you are trying to or need to let go of. I am always trying to let go of making other people feel okay with my decisions. Mm. I'm gonna There's, do one more. There's one on the bottom. Oh, so should I do that one? Yeah, I, I'm wondering what you- What would your younger you not believe about your life today? I think my younger me would not believe that there is so much kind of like peace and care within our entire family unit, not without its dysfunction, but like we have really like kind of, you know, not kind of healed every fracture, healed every wound, but there is this kind of genuine kind of flow of love and care mm -hmm. with all members of our family, which my parents, like, I just don't think were built to bridge that gap in my life as a child mm -hmm. um, and or needed more time. Mm -hmm. And I think as a kid, you just thought that it would always just be like an over here and an over there. And then you're just like having to figure out yourself over here. And now like the decisions kind of do flow and have a flow between all. What would you say you, um, it's like the biggest, catalyst to that? What did you change within the dynamic? You know, I think it's really about forgiveness, real forgiveness. I think it's really about not caring about the things you don't even care about. Yeah. Um, and it is like, I think that thing of forgiveness of like, it's not for you, it's not for me, it's for us. Because I do think that in forgiveness or apology or even, even especially even in forgiveness and like even if somebody couldn't bring you the apology, you're like, I actually want forgiveness for us. Mm -hmm. Like, even if I still like, cause I think if you don't feel the other person deserves your forgiveness, you'll never really be able to give it to them. Yeah. And you can still not feel that they deserve it from you or want to give it to them. But you probably feel that like the, to the entire, the us of it all deserves it. Um, that psychic, uh, her name's Carissa Schumacher and I was asking her about forgiveness because I think it's something I least like about myself. Mm. I find it hard to forgive. And she was telling me about the difference between forgiveness and mercy. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was sort of an interesting distinction if you can't quite get to forgiveness yet. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, forgiveness is especially hard for people who take such, um, take the ways in which they treat others so seriously. Mm. Like, you know, so it's just like, you're just, it's like you're, the offensives, there's offenses are so deeply offensive because you're just like, I would never, I would never, I would never. And I, I find that if I'm saying that about something, I'm like, wow, okay, I'll never be able to forgive if like I'm only in the ego of what I would or wouldn't do. I mean, you just, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I hate to say it. Cleo, thank you for that. And so it's like, if you can get, if I can get out of there, that space, like where there's absence of ego and only presence of like spirit, I'd say, or soul, yeah. mercy lives there, forgiveness lives there. But that's the hardest place. Cause you're like, you know, 
that's it's so hard to exit our judgments. It's so hard. My last question is, what is the smartest decision you've ever made? The smartest decision I ever made was probably, you know, really taking that big chance, that big risk to move to New York as such a young person. Mm -hmm. Um, And it probably seemed really dumb at the time um, to so many. But I just don't think that like all of the things that I'm so grateful to have today, I really feel that that was like the first step on the new journey that like, you know, I could say, I could have easily said like having my daughters, you know, saying yes to my first date with Simon, you know, signing a book, you know, like a book deal to make heart talk. But I think none of that would have been possible without saying yes to a giant risk. Like that was the smartest thing I ever did was say, was really get used to risk taking at an early age. Like, and I didn't know that at the time, but I was like, wow, so much of risk taking has to do with just being, having a habit and Mm -hmm. having a practice of doing it and doing it at, at 17, just like completely changed the possibilities for my life. Thank you for this therapy session. Oh my God, (laughs) thank you so much. This was so fun. Thank you and I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh my God. It's for us. It's for us.